welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. The message tonight is titled, Encountering God. It's entitled, Encountering God. And, you know, so often we, I think, get satisfied the fact that we will have an encounter with God. Maybe you came to this church, maybe you came to the altars and you had an experience of being born again, an experience of accepting Christ into your heart, whether that happened here or somewhere else. But, you know, many of us, we, 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 we often think that, okay, I've accepted the Lord and I had that wonderful experience. Then maybe we come into church and we have a great time of worship and we encounter God. And, you know, there's something about that presence at the end of worship where you just don't want it to end. You just want to press in. There's something about the anointing of God. His, you, you have this encounter with Him. And hopefully that just stirs in you a hunger that there's so much more of God to encounter. And so I want to deal with, you know, the areas of when you encounter God. I'm not talking about an intellectual exercise. A genuine heart encounter uh, where you somehow come face to face with the living God. And I'm going to deal with a number of different areas, so we're going to cover a lot of, uh, uh, of different material tonight. But I want to just say this. I have my um, oldest daughter, Christina, is on the, on the front row. She's um, just in her second year of law school in Philadelphia Temple University, and uh, it's a blessing to have her back for the summer. Um, we were missionaries. Many of you may know that we worked for Reinhard Bonke. We were, I was his television producer and traveled the world with him. And, and uh, television really was my heartbeat. And, and, and you know, uh, out of that, we became missionaries. We, uh, uh, as a family, we went to Nigeria. And for two years, we were in Nigeria. And we came under tremendous assault as a family. We came under tremendous attacks, things that we didn't know how to deal with. Our American Christianity hadn't prepared us for some of the things we experienced in the mission field. And um, my, my daughter ended up, when she was about four years old, having a, an encounter with the demonic. There was a, 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 a sorcerer, a Nigerian sorcerer, who was a high-level sorcerer masquerading as a Christian who tried to kill my daughter. And my daughter you know, can, can tell you as vividly as if it was, it was happening today. But she was lying in her bed and she looked up and she saw a, d- a demonic entity in her room. And it put tremendous fear in her. But then she heard the voice of an angel over her bed. And the angel spoke to the demon and said these words, it's the, 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 the angel said to the demon, don't you touch our Steggy. Now, Steggy was the nickname that we had given her because the only thing we had before we went, she took a stuffed animal of land before time. Littlefoot was a sort of her, her one stuffed animal that she took to the mission field. And she loved Stegosauruses and she loved dinosaurs. And so we had nicknamed her Steggy. And the angel used that word, says, don't you touch my steggy, is what he actually said. Now that encounter that she had was an amazing encounter because through all of the years of going through high school and all the things that have been thrown at her, let me tell you, it's been a defining experience. She has never doubted the existence of the spiritual, never doubted the existence of the supernatural. From that day to this day, that encounter changed her. And whenever we have a genuine encounter with God, it will mark us, it will change us. Now the interesting thing is that the, that the angel used an, a word and called her by the most endearing term that we had for her. It says, don't touch my steggy. Now, God, my first point is that God knows your name and he knows everything else about you. But it's important that you understand that God knows your name. Because many times we think that heaven's got these little computers going up there and, you know, that God's got, you know, a lot of, and it, 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 you know, and numbers and things to deal with. And he's got to handle all the problems of the world. And, and where do you fit into the mix of it? And would God have time to really know you and know you personally and know your name and know everything about you? We kind of 
mentally assent that he does, but it's another thing when you encounter the fact that he does. In Jeremiah 1.5, God says to Jeremiah, he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knows you from before you were born. Before he created you in the womb, no matter how you came into this world, before he formed you in the womb, God knew you. And he knew everything about you. It's interesting when you look at the encounters that people have in the Bible with God, how many times it starts with the name of the person. The Apostle Paul, before he was the, you know, the, 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 the person Saul who was trying to persecute the church. In Acts chapter 9, the Bible says that Saul was on his way to Damascus to throw the Christians in jail. And he has this encounter with Jesus. And listen what Jesus says. It says, and he, Saul, journeying, journeyed, he, as he, Saul, journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You see, as much as he was attacking and doing all the things he was doing, in his mind he was doing something good for God. But Jesus addresses him by name and says, Saul, Saul. And whenever Jesus calls you twice, you've got to watch out, you're in trouble. <laughs> Not necessarily. But it's interesting that Jesus knew everything about what Saul was doing. Why are you persecuting me? But he calls him by name. And so... You know, there's an expression in the English language that the sweetest word in the whole world is your own name. And when God speaks your name, it's a very powerful thing. I'm going to look at one or two other ones and then we're going to, we're going to bring this point to, to, to bear in where you are. First Samuel chapter 3. This is the little boy Samuel. He was, he was promised to his mother and it was a supernatural birth, and then his mother took him and put him in the temple because she promised him to God all the days of his life. Little Samuel was growing up in the temple. He was sleeping down the hall from the priest, and God came and said, Samuel, Samuel. Again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel ran to Eli. He didn't know the word of the Lord. He didn't know who God was. He had never encountered God before. And now God's encountering him by his name. And so, in 1 Samuel 3, verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Now the Lord came and stood and called us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. You see again, God encountering a life for the first time. God, it's very important that you understand God knows your name. He's interested in personally encountering you, in personally letting you know that he knows you. We come, this is an amazing story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was, a, you know, a tax collector. He was a very wealthy man. The guy, you know, had robbed everybody in the city of Jericho. And... Um, Yet Zacchaeus, you know, was hungry for God. You know, even people who are, who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, when they lie in bed at night, they're asking questions. What's the meaning of all this? You know, am I going to be judged for what I'm doing? They have questions about what they're doing. And we see Zacchaeus, he had this tremendous hunger for God, and then he heard that Jesus was coming through Jericho. And the Bible says that this rich guy would be like a guy in a, you know, in a Louis Vuitton suit or, you know, he had, you know, designer shoes on and he had a designer, you know, girdle around his waist and he was a wealthy guy with very fine clothing. But he wanted to see Jesus and the Bible says he climbs up a tree. Who knows how much he, he scuffed himself or tore the clothing or whatever. But he wanted so much to know about Jesus and Jesus, you know, stops under his tree. Massive crowds around him. And let's pick up the story in Luke 19. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector. He was rich. He sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd. He was of short stature. 
So he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I've taken anything from anybody by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus says, Salvation's come to this house. Now, remember, Jesus is coming. Jesus stops, looks up, and the guy's in the tree. He doesn't say, hey, you rich guy up there. He says, Zacchaeus. How did Jesus know his name? I'm sure when Zacchaeus came down, he was like, oh, Jesus knows my name. Jesus knows my name. And as they're going to his house, he starts to think it through a little bit more. And he thinks, well, if he knows my name, he knows I'm a tax collector. And he knows I'm a thief. See, Jesus doesn't just know your name. He knows everything about your life. Amen? Amen? But then Jesus called him. He had an encounter with him. And then he's also thinking, if he knows I'm a thief and he knows I'm a tax collector, he also knows that I go to bed at night and that I have all these questions and that I'm crying out to God for meaning in my life, and I'm crying out to God for direction. I'm crying out to God so that the God of Israel would reveal himself to me. God not only knows the things you've done wrong, but he knows the, the pain you've been through, and he knows where you are, and he knows the questions that bother you. He knows the, 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 the heart issues that you face. And he cares. He wants to reach you at that place. Amen? And so Jesus, you know what? Jesus didn't say to Zacchaeus, you need to repent. All on his own. He figured out. Jesus knows it all. He just, he automatically turns around and says, you know, I give, I give, you know, half of my goods to the poor. And he says, if anybody I've stolen from, I return fourfold. Well, that means he's probably bankrupt now. Because if you give back four times what you stole, then, you know, I don't know, you do the math. <laughs> Amen. When I was with Reinhard a number of years ago, Reinhard was ministering in Australia. And before the service in the morning, he was praying for this. It was a large, huge meeting that he was going to be preaching at. And when he was praying, the Holy Spirit spoke a word to him. And God said to him, at the meeting tonight, I want you to call out a young man by the name of John. Now, Rhino began to argue with the Lord. He said, Lord, this is Australia. Every second person here is called John. <laughs> it's like, you know, why can't you give me something more complicated? Or, you know, so people are going to say, oh, that's a really safe word. Somebody called John. Peter's here too, you know. I mean, and because he is thinking the people are going to judge this word and they're going to say, Rhino's just acting safe because... There's going to be a John in there. The Holy Spirit spoke back to him and said, but his name is John. I can't change his name. <laughs> he did not know that that morning there was a mother who had a 16-year-old child who had, who had turned away from God, was not serving him, was going in the way of the world. And... That young boy's name was John. And as that mother was praying that morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, ask your son to come to the meeting tonight. God is going to call him out by name. And the young boy said to his mother, said, Mom, if God calls me out by name tonight, my life will belong to the Lord. So that night when Reinhardt very foolishly got up and he was like, you know what, I know this doesn't sound really amazing, but there's a young man here by the name of John and God's calling you by name. Yeah. That man jumped up and he ran with tears in his eyes down to the altar and gave his heart to the Lord. Amen? Just your name. Just God speaking your name 
is the first thing in an encounter with God. And it can change your life from darkness to life when you realize that God not only knows your name, but He loves you completely and knows everything about you. We'll just touch on Daniel. Daniel was a man who sought God for three weeks. There was no answer. And then it says in verse 10 of Daniel chapter 10, he was still praying after three weeks. Nothing had happened, but suddenly it says, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And it says, and the, the man who touched him said, and he said to me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. I have now been sent to you. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. I've come because of your words. The Bible says there was a war going on. 21 days that, that, that Gabriel was, was hindered from bringing a message. But the Bible said the first day that Daniel set his heart to understand and to encounter God and to get a message from God, immediately that message was heard the first day. It took 21 days to get through. So God hears every single message immediately. Sometimes there is warfare in getting it through to us. Amen? Amen? And finally, David wrote these words about how much God knows you. Psalm 139, verse 14 says, I'll praise you. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. I was skillfully wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. In your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And just beautiful words that David writes about God. You know everything, my thoughts, your thoughts towards me. God's thoughts towards you are more than the sand. Do you know how much sand there is? He is his, the depth of God's love for you, the depth of his knowledge of you, the depth we will spend eternity encountering and getting to know God, and we will never exhaust him. Jesus said the very hairs on our head are numbered. He says that God knows everything about us. So that's our first area is just that God knows our name and he knows everything about us. And that should give us hope because he not only knows the bad stuff because we know he knows that, but he also knows the desires of your heart. He knows the questions. He knows the suffering you've been through. He knows the abuse. He knows the trouble. He knows the pain and everything in between. Amen? Yeah. Now the, the, the next point, and we only have three tonight, but not only does he know all of that, but we've got to learn not only to encounter him here at the altar or in worship. We need to start to learn to encounter him in every facet of daily life. God is much more involved in your life than you give him credit. You do not know how many accidents he's protected you from. You don't know the warfare that goes around you every day and how much God is engaged in, in watching over and caring and, and helping your life. Amen? Amen? You know, about nine months ago, I went through open heart surgery and um, when I was going into all of that and it was a you know, very difficult season, um, I... I picked up the phone and I got to speak to Pastor Diego Mesa, who's a wonderful friend of, of us and of the ministry, as well as just somebody who has been through, and many of you know Pastor Diego Mesa has, has really conquered and overcome some of the, probably one of the worst forms of cancer that one can go through. I think they gave him between six months and a year to live, and you know, it's now four years later, and, and God is just doing wonderful things. It's, his ministry and life are stronger than ever. So he's walked through some things. But he said something to me that changed my perspective. He said, you know, I used to listen for that booming voice of God. I used to listen for that, you know, that word of the Lord and that, 
that mighty prophecy or something that God would just speak in this incredible, wonderful way through a dream or a vision. He said, I've, during this season of my life, he says, I've begun to recognize what he calls the breadcrumbs of heaven. The breadcrumbs of heaven. That God leaves breadcrumbs. And those breadcrumbs are things that he orchestrates in your life that you just take for granted. And you're like, hmm, that's nice that that's there, but you know what, that's probably not God. It was just coincidence that that happened to be there. But God leaves breadcrumbs everywhere. And for me, as, as I was going into the surgery, you know, we carry a, a huge ministry. We, we, um, we have to trust God for between $160,000 and $200,000 a month. I have a, a large staff, and, and it was a tremendous pressure. It's always a tremendous pressure. But right before we went into, I went into this whole challenge of this, uh, of this heart uh, 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 issue that I was facing... God gave a provision to the ministry to sustain us through that season. Now, you can say, well, it was just coincidence and, you know, I'm going to go in and I had to have the surgery and everything else. And, but what God was doing was he was lifting off a pressure. He knew that that would be an issue in terms of me engaging and, and going through what I needed to go through. But God just put some, some breadcrumbs there. Now, I can say, well, it would have come anyway. Would it have come the day before I went into hospital, would it have come at any other time that it had never come in all the history of our ministry, but it happened to come in that day? For me not to recognize that God was saying, it's okay for you to go through this challenge. I'm with you and I'm providing for your ministry. Amen? It's God that gives you, you know, a promotion at work or favor with your boss. It's God that somehow brings together the pennies and enables you to pay a rent at the end of a month. He's much more involved in your rent. We'll look at that in a moment. He opens up extra hours so that you can pay certain bills. How many of you have had a time when you have been going through something and you turn on the radio or television or you come to church here and the preacher reads your mail and just brings a word that you needed to hear? You're right at that point and you say, God, I'm just trying out, and the word comes. Yeah. Pastor, I remember Pastor Bayless talking about how he, he got saved and how, you know, he was a hippie and he was, you know, just like had the bazillion questions. And he went to a church service and he just was encountered with God, and, but he hadn't accepted the Lord yet. And he went out after the service and he, sat and he, he was on the, on the, on the hood of his, of his pickup, of his truck that he was, you know, driving. And he looked up at the stars and he began to say, God, if you're there, what about? And he said, what about the, you know, you know, all the bad things that happen in the world? What about? And he gave God, I mean, about 10 questions. Nothing, nothing happened. The next night, he was invited back to the same church. And the minister got up, opened up his Bible, and literally quoted the first question he'd asked the night before. And read the word of God and gave an answer. Quoted the second question and read the answer. Quoted the third question. By about the fourth question, he was weeping and gave his heart to the Lord right there. Amen? God knows how to, how to you know, get an email to us or get a person who calls you up that hasn't ever called you up before. He can use many different means. And many times we do not give him credit for what he sends our way. But don't just look to God and say, oh, God, you can only answer me like this. I've got this little box. You've got to fit right into it. Look for the breadcrumbs of heaven. Look for those places that you don't, wouldn't necessarily give God credit for. Sometimes you go to a store and there's a special a sale on it. Just the item. It's just the size that you need. And it just fits and it just happens to be 50% off. <laughs> Ladies, come on, give me an Amen. Some of you are in the parking lots and you, you know, suddenly that one parking spot opens up that you just need and, you know, so I'm how many of you prayed in the parking lot? Come on, tell me the truth. God sets up divine connections with people. 
There was a, in the shout out that you have there is a lady who writes or a guy who writes about, you know, having a, a $480, one of those flash photography, you know, a parking, uh, no, what are you, violating of a traffic light signal. He goes into the judge and is about to, you know, ask for, for just the judge to reduce it. And the judge says, it's, it's, you know, well, what do you plead? He doesn't even have a chance to plead. The judge says, case dismissed, throw it out and off his record, zero charge. Don't tell me it's not God, amen? I tell my kids this all the time. Closed doors can be as greater guidance from God as open doors. Just because the doors close, sometimes we really upset, oh, you know, we acknowledge God in our way and doors just close. Let me tell you, God's protecting you. God's the greatest door opener and door closer on the entire planet. Amen? And when doors close, rejoice. Because it would have been a disaster to go that way. Amen? Let's look for the breadcrumbs of heaven. You know, sometimes God speaks to us through nature. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. We'll look at that at the very end. But I remember, you know, the pastor that of my ch uh, the church I was attending in Virginia. I was going to University of Michigan. And the pastor did a message on the sign of the rainbow and how the rainbow was a sign of God's covenant and that every time we see a rainbow, we are reminded of the covenant that God made with the earth. And it was an amazing message. And, you know, I got this letter from, from my pastor, and he would share the, a copy of the CD, or the, it was back in cassette tape in those days. And just as I was finishing the letter, somebody from down the hall in the dormitory where I was at the University of Michigan said, come and look. And I went to the window, and there was a 180-degree rainbow outside, the, outside. And the people who were away from us said that it went around the entire uh, dormitory, 180 degrees, left to right. I've never seen a rainbow before or after like that one. Don't tell me God wasn't showing off. I finished the letter and he put a, a, a full rainbow outside my door. I can say, well, what a coincidence. You know what? God leaves breadcrumbs and you need to recognize when they're his breadcrumbs and we need to give him glory and thanks for it. All right. This is when I'm going to deal with something that's, that's so vital for everyone, all of us to understand. God is in charge of every single penny that comes into your checkbook. Every cent that you receive, God has a role. Now, you know, sometimes we just say, oh, well, I got, you know, some money from grandma, or I got this, or I got that. You know what? This is one of the reasons why I really encourage people to, to put God first, and to give him the first tenth, and to honor him with your first fruits. Because the Bible says that then his covering, his anointing, and his ability to maneuver and move on your behalf kicks into play. Yeah. All right? Now, I learned this a very interesting way because one of my friends is a missionary in, in Africa he was in he was pretty much told by a supporting church here in California that if he did not come to a conference that they were having a missions conference they were going to cut off his support so he put the charge for the airfare on his credit card flew over hoping that in the two or three weeks that he was here that one of his partners one of his friends would say you know what we, we want to help you to cover the cost of that air ticket. Well, not only did nobody, you know, at the conference help him, but for the three weeks afterwards, nobody helped him, and he was about to fly back on the Wednesday. I called up this friend and, and, uh, on the Sunday, and I said to him, his name's Johan, I said, I said, Johan, I said, we have a, um, you know, an ISOM school that's gathering on Monday night. Why don't you come and join us, and you can share what you're doing there in Africa? Just as a, a way to try and reach out to him. Well, he came down the next day. It was Monday night. I sh we shared. He shared. And 
As he was sharing, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, take an offering for this, uh, this, this missionary. So I just said to the group, I said, look, we're going to have a break for some food. I said, we're just going to take an offering. If you want to bless and sow into his ministry, putting a basket over here, just do what you'd like to do. Well, when they went into the next session of the teaching, I went and counted up what was in the basket, and it was $1,093. And I thought, that's a great offering for just a small group of students. Actually, there was about 40 or 45 students there. And so I thought, you know, 1093 it's so close to... 1100 I'd reached into my pocket, took out seven bucks, and put it into the offering, making it a nice even figure, 1100 Well, I went back, and I was about to announce it and present it to the missionary when a person put up their hand and said, oh, I didn't put mine in. I've got another extra 100 Another person put up their hand and said, I've got another extra 30 So now I've got $1,230. I gave it to the missionary, and he, this strange look came over his face. He said, you know, that's very close to the cost of my ticket. I said, well, when you get your, back to your hotel, look it up and tell me what it was. He calls me up and he says, the cost of my ticket was $1,223. I said, I want my seven bucks back. God had it figured out to the very penny. And there's a whole bunch of different people. And I'm thinking, you know what? God had this guy's air ticket exactly to the dollar. Yeah. Me trying to help him wasn't helping him at all. But God was teaching me a lesson. Yeah. He's in charge of every cent that comes in. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that's the same in your checkbook. He's in charge of it all. You know, some people, they look for God, they want to encounter God with that, that booming voice. There's a wonderful example where Elijah really wants to hear from God. He wants an encounter with God. And so the Bible says that he goes to Mount Horeb because Mount Horeb was the place where God came down on the mountain, gave the Ten Commandments, and the whole, the whole you know, mountain was on fire. God spoke with his booming voice. And so Elijah is really going through a trial in his life, so he heads down to Mount Horeb. And he's wanting to have an encounter with God. This is what it says about it. It says, And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind. This is 1 Kings chapter 19, in verse 11. The Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... A still, small voice. Most of the time God speaks to you, it's in a still, small voice. We don't value silence. We don't value listening. The Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. The wonderful singer by the name of Andrea Bocelli blind singer, built an amphitheater out where he lives out in the Italian countryside. Takes 8,000 people can come in this amphitheater. And he, it's an amphitheater to celebrate silence. He has one concert a year, and the other 364 days, it lies still. And he's a man who values silence. One of my friends when I was growing up, He's my closest high school friend, a man by the name of a, uh, Andrew Shade. And he and I were, you know, just contemporaries at high school. His father was an amazing guy that took a 22-foot uh, yacht and sailed around the entire world alone at the age of 19. And he came at the end, while we were going to school, and he did a, this amazing slide presentation. We were back in slides in those days, no PowerPoint or anything, but... He did this amazing PowerPoint, sorry, the slide presentation. 
And he's given this, inc this incredible experience of, of, of traveling to all these islands and these strange people and giving this amazing, amazing. Now, this is a guy that's not a Christian, not saved, doesn't have a relationship with God like you and I may know it. And I remember as he was doing this presentation, he got to a section where he got caught in the equator in a thing called the doldrums, where there's no wind. It's absolutely like glass. And he, it, was, it was completely still for about seven or eight days. Not a sound. And he stopped his presentation in the middle of this whole thing that he was giving. And this is what he said. He said, you know, after seven days of sitting in total silence, he said, then I knew that there was a God. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And many times we need to learn to encounter God in that still small voice, that place of silence, that place of listening, that we can hear what the Spirit's saying. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can you take one last quick point? Whatever you've encountered of God, you've just scratched the surface. You've just begun to just touch a tiny, tiny part of who God is. And many times we're like, oh, you know, God, I know you in worship. Or I, I know you as my Savior, Lord. I know you as my baptizer in the Holy Spirit. I know you, Lord, as my healer. And we can encounter a tiny facet of God's greatness, of his power, of his anointing, of his, of his awesomeness. But if you go through the scriptures, you'll find hundreds upon hundreds of names for God. The reason why God has got so many names is not because he's schizophrenic. It's because he's got so much diversity in him. And every single one of his names just reveals just, just a tiny fraction more of that dimension of him. Amen? Just the book of Revelation has these names of Jesus. Just listen to them. He's the firstborn from the dead, the highest of the earthly kings. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Lord God, the Almighty, the Son of Man, the first and the last, the living one, the Son of God, the faithful witness, the creator, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb, the shepherd, the Christ, the anointed one, the faithful and true one, the word of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and the beginning and the end. Those are just in the book of Revelation. Amen? And every one of those has a facet. Every one of those you can explore and explore because it's, it's wonderful. It's amazing. And we need to learn to encounter God in a far greater dimension than we've ever dreamed of. Amen. We can experience more dimensions of who God is. And God wants to challenge us. Many times we look at these marvelous names given in the Old Testament of Jehovah. Jehovah, I'll just give you a few. We'll put them up on the, on the screen here. Jehovah, Jehovah Rohi, Arohi, the Lord is my shepherd. You know how just encountering God as your shepherd, as your guiding person who leads you on the way. That's a whole dimension of his character and his nature. Jehovah, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. There's a whole dimension of God's healing, of his healing of your emotions, of your relationships, of your person, of your body, of your mind, of every facet of your life. God is a great healer. Amen. We've only just touched on it. We say, well, God healed my toe. Well, that's just the tiny tip of it. There's so much more of his healing, his healing nature that we need to understand. Jehovah Tzikenu, the Lord our righteousness, the Lord Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Let me tell you, I, I, I love this one, Jehovah Jireh. We'll talk about it in a moment as we close out here, but 
that one is just an incredible that God can provide for you every need in your life. The Lord, your banner, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom. God is your peace. There is a dimension of God's peace that we can all experience. You can encounter God as your peace. You can encounter Him as your healer, as your shepherd, as your deliverer, as, as your you know, soon coming king, your fortress. You can encounter every dimension of God. Amen? Jehovah Eli, just Eli, Elion, the most high God, El Roy, the strong one who sees, El Shaddai, the God of the mountains, or God Almighty, and Elohim, the everlasting God. That's just a few from the Old Testament. You know, this is one of the reasons why I created the International School of Ministry. Is I realize that certain people around the world have encountered God in a greater dimension. And so I, I, I traveled to Israel. Well, I would bring a guy from Israel to here. We actually brought him to this, pa this podium, Dr. Gerald Schroeder. Because I want, to, I want to capture what God's given him. We went to the Philippines to deal with the same on betrayal because you know what? I knew that this person had encountered God's revelation in that area. As we go now into the Rock Bible College, as we, the leadership college that's going to be starting in a few weeks, my challenge to you is that's the kind of thing you should be hungry for. Because it will enable you to encounter God in so many more dimensions, in so many more ways. And I challenge every believer. It's a challenge that God's put in my own heart. Be hungry to encounter God in greater and greater measure, in greater, greater ways. Amen? What you've experienced is just the start. I close with this story. When I was with Reinhardt, one of our teachers on the ISOM is a man by the name of Wayne Myers. In fact, he was the guy we were playing that night that had the miracle with, with my friend at the air ticket. Wayne Myers is a missionary to Mexico, has been serving God over 50 years on the mission field, and he teaches a message called Living to Give. I, I filmed this guy for five hours, and there was nothing that the guy said that was just that amazing to me. What was amazing to me was that for five hours I had to look at this face on the screen that glowed like the sun. I had never seen such joy in the life of a human being than what I experienced in those five hours filming this guy teaching on living to give. This guy just goes through and, and, and he, he lives his life to give and to give and he lives in a supernatural place of God's provision because it comes in one door and it goes out the other. He drives a beat up uh, station wagon, but you know what? God puts millions through his hands and touches lives. He's put more roofs on buildings in Mexico. He has helped pastors. He's paid for people to go through Christ for the Nation's Bible school. He has done more than you can imagine. And one of my friends, he worked for Reinhardt. We were doing a conference in Europe together. His name's Grant Gill. And Grant had to drive Wayne around England for seven days and had to hear all these stories of him giving and giving and giving and God would always give back. And one of the things that kept challenging him was that he talked about giving cars to pastors. He's given, I don't know, hundreds of cars to pastors. And he, he just looks for a car, sees a pastor that's got a need and he helps that pastor get a car. And so Wayne... He was sharing all these messages. My friend Grant was like, God, you know, I've never given anything to almost anybody. He said, I want to give a car to a pastor. So he began saving up his money, and he saved up enough so that on his next missions trip to Africa that he was going to go and get a car for a pastor. He got down to Africa on the mission trip. He just had this little amount of money for one car. And as he was driving, he came past a big sign, and it said, Car Auction Today. And the Holy Spirit said, go in there. Well, there were 11 cars up for auction. And it was a silent auction where they, they put the window down just a little bit and you had to write out a bid, your name and number, put it into the car, and whoever they opened the car and whoever had the highest bid got to buy the car. Well, he looked at how much money he had, so he put a bid into a car. 
Then he thought, well, what happened if I don't win that car? He says, well, I might as well put a few other ones in. He ended up putting a bid on all the 11 cars. <laughs> when they opened up, I think he was thinking pounds and they were thinking African money. He won all 11. <laughs> but he only had money for one. And so he now began to sweat. He says, God, I... I what am I going to do? And so he asked the guy, he says, can I take that one? He chose a green Ford Sierra. He said, I, and the guy thought he was going to go test drive the car and take it and go get the money from the bank. He gave his keys to the guy. He took the Sierra, drove down the road, and now he just wanted to get away, and he's praying, he's sweating, he's just, just absolutely hysterical inside, just saying, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay this? And as he's driving down the road, he sees a big sign that it says, for dealership, we buy used cars for cash. <laughs> God says to him, go in there. And he takes the Ford Sierra into the Ford dealership, and the dealer pays him enough money to buy all the 11 cars. <laughs> Amen? So he gave 10 cars away. Now, I made sure, because I, I emailed him, and I said, look, I, I'm using this in my book, and I need to be able to verify the story's true. He said, well, that's not the end of the story. He said, I've now given away 30 cars, and I have one in my garage waiting for God to tell me who to give it to. See, once you encounter God in a dimension, it opens up a whole area he has now moved into an area of provision, of supernatural trust and provision. And as he keeps stepping on those waters, God just keeps giving him more and more and more. And you can open up every single area of God's provision. You can open up every dimension of God. If you have a hunger enough to pursue it. A hunger enough to say, God, I want to know you as my healer. I know you as my provider, but I don't know you as my healer. I don't know you yet, God is my, you know, my defender or my deliverer. Every dimension of God, you can encounter Him. But you've got to realize you just, just scratched the surface. You have to have a hunger in your heart to pursue those areas of encounter that God is calling you into. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. God spoke to you. Amen. It would be a shame to close this service and not give those here who have never encountered Jesus as their Savior, who never had that personal encounter with Him. The fact is Jesus does know everything about you. He knows all that you've done, all the things that you've done wrong. But He also knows the desire of your heart for meaning, the desire of your heart for, to find God, to, to know that He loves you, that He cares. The Bible says that he loved the world so much that he gave his life for you. He died for you on a cross. And that's not just something that just happened way back many years ago. It's something that you can encounter and experience tonight. You can experience the salvation of God. You can encounter Jesus tonight. Because the Bible says that when you embrace what he did for you, he washes your past away, he makes it clean. And he opens up an opportunity for you to encounter him in your heart, that he actually will change you on the inside. The Bible describes that experience as being, being born again. And I remember that I didn't even understand the terminology when I was 12 years old and I was in a church and somebody shared that I could have a personal relationship with God, that Jesus could come into my heart and change me on the inside. And I didn't even have an altar call like we're going to have tonight where we have an opportunity to really pray and see that happen. I just was in a pew in an African church with bats flying up and down the ceiling and the rafters. But I prayed that personally in my own heart and I walked out into the night and I encountered Jesus. I turned to one of my friends who was one of the only Christians in the school. I said, I don't know what just happened, but I feel a peace I've never felt before. From that day to this day, I have encountered and known Jesus as my Savior. And I want to give everybody here a chance tonight, if you've never encountered Him as a Savior, if you've never encountered His salvation, never encountered His forgiveness of your sin, that He can cleanse you and wash you, 
and make you a new person on the inside. And he can forgive your past. And just like what happened to Zacchaeus where salvation came to his house, salvation can come to your life and to your family and to your future. I want us all just to bow our heads right now. I'm going to give everybody a chance wherever you are. If you need that tonight and you want me to pray for you and you need that experience, you need to encounter Jesus as your Savior. And tonight you want to cross that threshold and you want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you want to experience His forgiveness wherever you are. Just raise up your hand. I'm going to just acknowledge your hand. You can put it right back down again. Anybody that needs that tonight, that you need to encounter Jesus, I see your hand back there. I see your hand over there. Anybody else? Just put up your hand. Anybody else that needs that prayer tonight? Anybody else that needs to find Jesus as Savior tonight? I see a hand over the side over here. Anybody else? The don't let this message go by you. Don't not take advantage of finding Christ tonight, of experiencing Him personally, of encountering His forgiveness and His love. One last opportunity. Anybody else that needs salvation tonight, you need to experience Jesus because what you have right now will not get you into heaven. If you've never been born again and you have never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and made Him fully the Lord of your life and turned from your sin, you've, you're, not, you're not saved. And you can find Him tonight. He's calling you. And this message is for you tonight. Just raise up anybody else that needs to join those people. I'll give you one last chance. Just raise up your hand for a moment. Anybody else? There were a handful of hands. Let's all stand in the presence of God. And I'm going to ask those people that raised their hands or you should have raised your hands and you want me to pray for you. I want you just to step in the aisles and I want you to come and meet me down up front. Let's give them a hand as they do that. I'd like to personally pray for you. If tonight you need to find Jesus as Savior, come forward. We're going to pray for you. You're going to find an encounter with God tonight as your Savior. God bless you. God bless you. If you should have raised your hands, I want you to come up. Come down. Tonight's your night. Do not let this anointing go by. Do not, not take advantage of the presence of God that's here tonight. Anybody else that needs to find Jesus? Anybody else? God bless you. I know there were a number of other people that were touched tonight. I want you to put your hand over your heart. We're going to pray this together. Pray it from your heart. Say, Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You came to this earth, born of a virgin. You grew up to be a man. And you went to a cross, died a horrible death for my salvation. You took the penalty for my sins. I ask you, Jesus, wash away my past. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart. I ask you now, be my Lord and be my Savior. Let me experience your forgiveness. Wash my past with your blood. I thank you, Jesus, that I am now a child of God. And I'm headed for heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. If you can just turn, follow Pastor Dave.